Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear friends, uh, yes, I'm, I'm very glad to be here uh, today and I have to say thank you very much to the organizers of uh, this meeting and thank you very much for your attention uh, to my speech or maybe to my talk. Uh, I don't prefer to call it uh, lecture, uh, but uh, I would like to call it uh, just a talk and then uh, I count on uh, our discussion, uh, not only on your questions, uh, but maybe your remarks, comments. Uh, it is my second time here in uh, Strasbourg, uh, and I remember the first time, it was December 2004, and uh, it was in the time of Orange Revolution. Uh, it was also a very short visit here. I didn't really have a time to, uh, to see the city. Uh, it was also just one day and uh, I had to tell something about uh, the topical situation in Ukraine at that moment. <coughs> it was initiated, um, uh, it was organized by, uh, by the Greens from European Parliament and uh, so I, I have, um, I have remembered uh, uh, this uh, time as uh, maybe the uh, happiest period of my life because we stood at that moment uh, on uh, some historical threshold. Uh, it, uh, it was a time, uh, the, the, maybe middle of December and uh, we had uh, some week or maybe uh, 10 days before we had to vote uh, for the third time uh, at our presidential elections and the, the country, uh, society and myself, uh, we were full of hope and big European expectations. Uh, so I, I would say it was very optimistic time. And uh, uh, this time today, this moment, this, uh, this moment now is, uh, is not so optimistic. And, uh, but still, I, I would like to uh, to ponder uh, some ideas concerning European identity today. Um, as a writer, uh, I would like to focus uh, my attention um, on the uh, linguistical aspect of identity. Uh, I think uh, language is uh, very dramatic and very important part of, uh, of each identity. And uh, I had written once uh, the bigger essay under the title, What language are you from? So I, I meant uh, sometimes language is uh, more important than, uh, let's say, country. Uh, language is a kind of, of mental country or mental part of the world. Uh, so that's why uh, the philology will dominate uh, in my talk today, uh, not the politics. Uh, but I wouldn't say uh, this talk will be completely free of, of politics, of political aspects, but uh, we have to understand them as uh, uh, the politics in uh, uh, broadest 
sense of this world. And uh, then, of course, we will have the possibility to, uh, to discuss uh, some points of, uh, of this uh, topic. And uh, I would try to answer uh, all the questions you will have if the questions will concern uh, the political, the strict political situation in Ukraine. Two. Uh, this my talk uh, has been entitled Europe, culture on the edge of the world, or who are the losers? And uh, it has been partly provoked uh, by some ideas uh, formulated by French author uh, researcher whose name is uh, Frédéric Martel, especially uh, his book uh, called Mainstream on Global War on Culture, published I think 2010. And uh, there is a very interesting and provoking uh, point of view on the global cultural processes as a kind of, uh, of war. And in that, uh, uh, in, in that view, uh, author uh, proposes uh, some idea that uh, in, in this uh, constant constant cultural conflict in that war. Uh, Europe uh, is one of the global losers. Uh, the winners are, uh, first of all, United States of America, and, uh, and then uh, the countries uh, which are standing on the threshold of uh, domination, like uh, China, India, Brazil, <coughs> and uh, Europe uh, loses uh, because of uh, two chief reasons. The first of them is uh, uh, Europe is still divided into uh, some national cultural markets. So in the terms of cultural market, uh, this is a uh, completely divided entity. And uh, the second reason is uh, uh, Europe still prefers uh, to apply uh, to some high culture, to some uh, elitistic values, uh, to some uh, non-commercial values of art and culture. And, uh, of course, uh, this is uh, the way of loser in the world where uh, the art and culture uh, become more and more commercial. So, uh, I would try, uh, not really deny these ideas, but maybe uh, I would try just uh, convince myself uh, there is something uh, magic in this uh, European striving uh, to be a loser. It is quite possible that there is indeed no such thing as Europe in the sense of an united integral entity. There are, of course, attempts to create a Europe in such format, in the cultural dimension in particular. But it is doubtful that such attempts have a realistic chance of success as of today. That is, if the term success is applicable here at all in the first place. Provided we 
reject the global pop trash and some specimens of must read classics, we are about to find ourselves forced to agree that an average, let's say, Irishman and an average Albanian reside in entirely different cultural spaces. And neither is going to merge the spaces into a single entity. Although, let's go beyond this geographically remote pair of nations. A Frenchman and a German are less remote, more active on the outside in terms of culture, and have perceptibly more in common. Nevertheless, their cultural spaces tend to diverge more often than converge. Moreover, even inside a common state structure like Switzerland, cultural spaces of the French-speaking West and the German-speaking Center and East differ quite dramatically. Immediately a question arises, is this necessarily a bad thing? To which extent does this plurality of cultural spaces and orientations marginalize Europe in its imaginary cultural confrontation with the rest of the world? Such a question appears to be rather a philosophical one. Does the complexity and heterogeneity in the cultural dimension indeed lows to unifiedness and simplifiedness. And what does losing mean anyway? Is this a matter of who is scoring goals and who is conceding them? On which level do cultural phenomena compete with each other? What does a reflection of such competition look like in culture? like a victory of mass culture over high culture. But how can there be a victory where there has been no war? That is, the competitors have never even met since they are competing in entirely different divisions. Indeed, if we hold on to our analogy with sports and competitions, maybe even in different kinds of sports. Since I have not found an answer, here's another question I wish to ask. Where does this heterogeneity and cultural fragmentation of Europe come from anyway? And hence arises yet another question, to which extent it is prone to changes and alterations. To which extent can Europe be equalized and homogenized? Many years ago, 21 years ago to be exact, I had the first chance in my lifetime to reside in the very heart, so to say, of old Europe, having thus added Munich Innsbruck, Venice, Ravenna, and Florence to my subsequently compiled list of intimate cities. As a consequence of my three months long residence amid those landscapes, an idea emerged, eventually encapsulated in one of my later essays entitled An Introduction to Geography, an idea that the European man was created by mountains and woodlands. Apparently, I was thus referring to the limited nature and specific properties of each separate location and to the fact that each of those locations is related to a certain dimensionally larger composition. I suggested that, it, that this had a crucial influence 
upon what the perception of form in its European incarnation would turn out to be. Thus the question of how to equalize Europe therefore become a question of how to flatten its mountains or a question of how to thin out its forests. How can the surface of Europe become flat? How can it be iron smooth and even and what kind of iron is to be applied to that pure pose? The very geography resists this idea, that is the idea of an united Europe where united is understood as unified and simplified. However, apart from geography, we should also consider history, which has processed Europe quite comprehensively. History, not geography, divided Europe into at least three major segments, Western, Eastern, and East Central. As far as the situation of the latter is concerned, there are several suggestions, and here is the one I deem to be the most convincing one. Between the East, that is Russia and the post-Soviet space, and the West, that is so-called old Europe, there lies something which is regarded as the East by the West and as the West by the East. And in this very stripe, you will find countries populated by people speaking East Central European languages and writers composing their works in the respective languages of those countries. So if there really are losers and outsiders in the cultural processes, it is first and foremost the representatives of these countries and cultures. If we assume there were indeed any wars in the dimension of culture, then the East Central Europeans were the ones who lost those wars more often than anyone else. If we examine the currents and trends of cultural products in terms of exports and imports, we can state that in East Central Europe, the volume of imports is overwhelmingly larger than the volume of exports. So overwhelmingly that it evokes a rescuing suspicion that maybe this position of an outsidership is in fact position of a secret leadership. However, before we examine what this leadership actually consists in, let's ascertain what has been its cause. In other words, why have East Central Europeans turned out to be the cultural losers of the contemporary world? Culture even in its broadest understanding, has always been and continues to be centered on language. Language, language, and once again language invests culture with sense and durability. Even if the language becomes poorer as we are watching it, even if it is shrinking, and even if it possesses and operates fewer and fewer words. Nowadays, we are witnessing this reduction of language. However, despite the increasingly important presence of the visual, or let's say pictorial, in cultural messages, the verbal still retains its 
substantial load of sense. Even if we press like or repost on our iPhones, we still confirm with it our dependence upon the verbal. We still wish to say. We still wish to tell. As far as literary messages are concerned, those are attracting fewer and fewer people capable of reading and understanding the works of literary fiction, but still these messages retain their long-lasting uniqueness. And it is clear why this is so, because out of all the existing means of expression, those are the closest to thinking and thought. So I propose to focus on literature, which is both the outsider and the secret leader of the cultural space, as well as on a very special situation in which it finds itself in East Central Europe. Does a separate East Central European literature exist? If so, where is it? Who is its embodiment in our 21st century? Those are the questions I received from Berlin. No much wonder about that, since Berlin preoccupies itself with everything to the east of itself more than any other metropolitan capital of the Occident. My reply to my Berlin inquirer is a rather simple one. The 21st century has so far not delivered any radical change to the global literary stages, since we cannot view the Eastern enlargement of the European Union as a change in such sense. The EU has enlarged, all right, what's done is done. That said, writers of Central and Eastern Europe have not started to write differently as a result of that, in some other languages, for instance. Therefore, the East Central European literature is nowadays represented by the same languages it used to be represented in the 19th century, that is, Polish, Czech, Slovak, Hungarian, Ukrainian, Belarusian, Serbian, Slovenian, Lithuanian, etc. The Croatian language, once regarded as inseparable from the Serbian language, officially joined this company in the 1990s. My Berlin Enquirer has listed 17 languages in total stretching from Estonia to Albania across the entire Central Eastern European territorial stripe. I beg to differ a little bit. I reckon the number is 16, since the Moldovan language is, in my understanding, not a language proper, but merely a somewhat Sovietized variant of Romanian. However, in the stripe just outlined by me, one can also find some languages of its minorities. German, Russian, Ruthenian, Romani, remnants of Yiddish, some other quasi-languages, sub-languages, unrecognized children, Kashubian, Old Prussian, Moravian, Sorbian, the language of Karaims and the language of Azovian Greeks, so-called Urums, languages of some other entities, Karl Marcus Gauss, an Austrian writer and researcher of the so-called dying or unknown Europeans, could have composed an even longer list. Incidentally, we can mention that at this very moment, in any of these languages, 
be it one of the 16 principal ones or one of the supplementary ones, a literary masterpiece may well be being written and it is possible that the last line of this masterpiece will have been completed by the end of our discussion today. But who is there to find out about it? James Joyce is a world-famous literary icon, primarily owing to his uncommercialness and unreadability. But who would have Joyce become if he had used not English, but let's say Albanian, as a vehicle for his creative work? How many people globally would be familiar with Joyce's works under such linguistic circumstances? How many people would believe, would believe the Albanians in their assertion that their Joyce was really a literary genius. So here it is. It is the author's writing in all of the above mentioned languages of East Central Europe, as well as their works that actually constitute this very East Central European literature. But if so many languages comprise it, and if all these languages are so diverse and different from each other, what, what does actually unite them? What exactly allows us to say that there exists a certain phenomenon? Well, first of all, there is common history and common social characteristics and common faiths and common experiences. The 20th century revolutions, the dictatorial regimes, the Nazi occupation, the communist era with violence and oppression as its components, the feeling of being not an active subject but a passive object of the historic great game of confrontation between Russia and the West. Suffice it to remind ourselves about one of the simplest definitions of East Central Europe as a territory between the Germans and the Russians. Or, quoting an enigmatic Polish geopolitician of the 1930s who was writing under the pseudonym Viktor Schirma, as a juncture of nations located between the German and the Russian ethnic spaces. Such a location between two imperialisms did not, of course, give birth to any optimistic prospects. The Central European sense of fear is historically vacillating between two sources of anxiety. The Germans are coming or the Russians are coming. As I wrote in one of the essays about this strangest part of the world. To the above mentioned, let's also add the permanent censorship obstructions and pressure from the forces in power coercing writers into collaboration. This is a very special East Central European feeling of unliberty and suspension. Apart from the external factors, the occupiers and the aggressors, the Russians and the Germans, let's also mention the internal factors present in the region. Mutual phobias, vendettas, and various limitations of linguistic and cultural nature. Romanian, Hungarian, Polish, Ukrainian, Czech, Hungarian, Serbian, Croatian, Hungarian, Slovak, etc. All being couplings of hatreds, as it were. In our focus, there are quite many striking examples of these. 
Poles barring Ukrainians from access to universities in the interwar period. Ukrainians who retaliated by destroying Polish cultural heritage after World War II. Romanians blocking cultural self-identification of the Hungarian and the German minorities. Undoubtedly, the Romanians have also suffered from certain abusers at a certain time in history. As far as the Serbian, Croatian and Bosnian context is concerned, I shudder even while keeping silent on that matter. Sometimes it seems to me that East Central Europe is a terrain on which the ethnic has permanently been dominant over the ethical. That is, we have a long, long history of mutual cultural destruction. Actually, this is not exactly history yet. It is still very much the aggregation of the events of the present time. It is our nowadays. To this bouquet, pardon the expression, let's also add the Jewish tragedy. Is Central Europe turned out to be the primary arena of the Holocaust? What was the role played in it by representatives of various East Central European nations and ethnic groups? The answer to this question is still an extremely difficult one and has been neglected for a far too long, but it is upon the answer to this very question that their future fate depends to a certain degree. Ukrainians, for instance, are still unable to put themselves on a track heading, heading towards social healing. And in my opinion, this is due to the fact that we have so far failed to work through the topic of our collaboration in both directions with Hitler as well as with Stalin. This procrastinated task is constantly devouring us and it will never leave us in peace on its own unless we put our conscious effort into dealing with it. All of those repressions, all of those taboos, those skeletons in the closets and stories yet untold constitute amongst other things, also the unique, unheard of, and so far unspent potential to be channeled into the realm of literature. In their own unsuccessful countries, the writers of East Central Europe have to confront and deal with phenomena for encounters with which they are more Western colleagues travel to Somalia or Bolivia. However, the enumerated symptoms of historical and social commonality comprise only one of the preconditions of yet another commonality, the purely aesthetic one. This commonality is of paramount interest to us. A kindred awareness of language. This is what characterizes writers from this strangest part of the world. The literatures of East Central Europe are being created in the lesser languages, which, due to their lack of global influence, owing to their marginality and functional unfitness, have been forced to develop inside themselves, to intensify, since it was impossible to extensify. They have thus accumulated their own qualities of melancholy, irony, and refinement, qualities which eluded almost everybody and which were untransmittable in any translation. Each of these languages 
and hence also each of the literatures created using those languages became a thing in itself. An East Central European writer is actually narrating his or her story not for the sake of narrating a story, but for the sake of using a language for which the surrounding world cares so little that it requires recurrent rescue operations, that its viability needs to be reconfirmed over and over again, at least to oneself. Language is no longer merely a material or a means or an instrument. It now becomes, forgive me, sudden bombastic tone, the sense of existence, fragile and ever threatened. The more you use it and the deeper you immerse into it while using it, the more evidence there appears testifying to the fact that it will indeed survive. And if we replace the word evidence with the word illusions, we shall get even closer to the truth. East Central European literature is autistic and autarkic in its own way and thereby in the European dimension leave alone the global one, it is doomed to be exotic, incomprehensible, and hence uncommercial. If uncommercialness is regarded as the equi equivalent of unsuccessfulness, then we shall be able to derive an answer to the question of who really loses. My Spanish publisher lives in Barcelona and his publishing house runs two parallel publishing programs in Spanish and in Catalan. They say that the Catalan segment has visibly shrunk in the last several years, apparently due to commercial issues. However, the publisher himself is a Catalan intellectual and at his university, he reads his lectures in world literature in Catalan only. Which language are we going to be publishing you in? This was the question he asked me a long time ago, at the very beginning of our cooperation. And I fired out in Spanish, of course. Fortunately, I was reserved enough not to verbalize what I thought right afterwards. Who on earth needs translations in some Catalan language? Who needs this lesser language? Spanish. Spanish is global. It is the language not only of Spain, but also of Mexico, Peru, Argentina, other fabulous lands I had never visited, plus a sizable chunk of the United States. The prospect of the big picture utterly took my breath away. The publisher understood me all right and nodded in agreement, but he seemed very sad about that. So sad that I was suddenly ashamed. I am still ashamed for that rapid feat of imperial chauvinism I got into at that moment. I then resolved never to offend any language in the world again. I described the flashback of this episode in order to accommodate a certain analogy. Writing in one of the languages of the East Central Europe is like writing in Catalan, or in Irish Gaelic, or in Welsh, or even in reto romansh in one of its five dialects. It is like writing in Schweizerdeutsch, Swiss German, in one of its dialects, Bernese German, for instance. There is nothing impossible about it. Each of the mentioned languages 
is used not only to write, but to publish hundreds of books. To each of those niches, Europe grants a right to exist. As a matter of fact, not only a right, it also subsidizes their functioning. Thank God, Europe still has money to support them. Or even if it doesn't have those money, it still pretends it does. Writing in one of the languages of all the Central Eastern Europe is like living on subsidies. The literature of Central Eastern Europe, at least in its most distinctive manifestations, is subsidized all the way through. It is like modern opera, new music, or free jazz. What is the difference Peter Konradin Zumtor, a prominent Swiss drummer, asks me. What is the difference between a rock music concert and a concert of contemporary avant-garde? I shrug my shoulders in ignorance. At a rock concert, Peter says, the audience knows the name of every performer. At a concert of contemporary avant-garde, the performers know the name of every person in the audience. We laugh, a little too loudly. What is the difference, asks Peter again, between punk and jazz? I shrug my shoulders again in compliance with the unwritten rules of this game we are in. Punk is when they play three chords for a thousand people, says Peter, whilst jazz is when they play a thousand chords for three people. The situation is the same with the literature of East Central Europe. Its authors play in their own languages using a thousand chords and know each and every one of their readers, at least their faces, if not the names. It is the literature of low circulation and several encouraging awards, including the Nobel Prize. It is the literature of sinecures and scholarships. All of the above testifies to the fact that this is the ideal literature. It exists for the sake of its language and believes that its language exists for the sake of its literature, the literature utilizing it as vehicle. And so the two of them stick together, mutually justifying their existence before miscellaneous subsidizing institutions, the cumulative aggregation of which we can jokingly refer to as, let's say, God. Now I have to examine the relations of East Central European literary peripheries in connection with their metropolitan centers. How correct would it be to examine those in the context of post-colonialism? In my opinion, even if it is, we are nonetheless dealing with another variety of post-coloniality. The classical post-colonial literary examples originating, say, from India, Indochina, Africa, or Latin America, are being created in the global, larger languages. Problems of translation, comprehension, and of readers' penetration into the text face incomparably fewer problems and have incomparably greater chances to be resolved. In other words, a novel originally written in English or Spanish, regardless of the quality of its text, has considerably higher chances to succeed. The careers of writers under these circumstances usually follow a geographical path of moving from the colonies and settling in their respective linguistically metropolitan countries. 
and thereafter they keep writing about Bangladesh and Kenya while residing in London, about Algeria or Dakar while living in Paris, about Macondo or Manila while a bidding in Madrid, or about Mozambique while dwelling in Lisbon. And in doing so, in no way do those migrant authors lose their own initial identity. A French-speaking Vietnamese continues being a Vietnamese writer, although in the reference materials he is still defined as a French Vietnamese. The reason apparently lies in the fact that multicultural openness is a one-way street of sorts. It is characteristic of the representatives of the Western civilization only. As for the so-called components of multiculturality themselves, or otherwise the post-colonial migrants, they do not display a particular openness to things foreign and, as befits an exotic creature, creature shut themselves inside their own microcosmos. Not to drive the passions too high with this issue, I shall recourse to what I would refer to as mild examples of this divergence. Germans, for example, love Thai restaurants, but it is difficult in turn to imagine a Thai family from Munich happily feasting on sausages and cabbage. Or maybe the second example, some of us smoke uh, Pakistani hashish, but it is difficult to imagine Pakistani migrants releasing schnapps and supplementing it with beer. Multiculturalism, therefore, turned out to be a value only for the Westerners, probably because the Westerners is like a sponge, desiring to absorb everything, each experience, each of his or her contacts with the diversity of the world. This multiculturalism is an unconscious attempt to swallow the world, to rebuild the grandeur of the empires, at least on the level of one's own self. East Central European authors, as a rule, are virtually denied this privilege of retaining their own identity despite a renunciation of their own lesser language, or, if you wish, despite a liberation from it. Language is one of the pillars of this identity of theirs. When you switch from your lesser language to a greater one, you have to be aware of the consequences. That is, that with such a transition, you are destroying a very important part of yourself inside yourself. That is, you are not forbidden to switch from a lesser language to one of the global ones, as Milan Kundera did, for instance. But you have to be ready to face attacks and boycotts as a result of your defection. Upon escaping from your native language, you will not necessarily remain yourself in the foreign one. In any case, we can rule out a possibility of, of a defection of such kind in another geographical direction to our own post-colonial center, Moscow. I cannot imagine any one of us originating from Lithuania, Latvia, Slovakia or Poland, moving to Moscow and then writing in the Russian language while retaining his or her own cultural identity. Well, if Moscow is a no, maybe Vienna would be a yes. That great cultural metropolitan capital of the olden days imprinted in our memory with much more pleasant connotations. Can the Vienna of today attract people born in its former colonies? 
May this question remain open for the time being. The special place of Austrian literature in the canon of the 20th century is indisputable, as far as the present century is concerned. That may or may not be so. After all, the special Austrian format of the German language allows many East Central Europeans to view Austrian authors as fellow sufferers in terms of language reception. Maybe there is a chance to view the German-Austrian language as a certain communicative bridge, that is, as a special transitional language between the lesser and the global ones. The last question from Berlin is a logical question to conclude with. That is, what are the future prospects? Will East Central European literature still be in existence 20 years from now? There are some grounds for a dramatic finale of that kind, and I myself have been trying to find those grounds every now and then in the past. And I keep asking myself this question even now. But if we assume, in the first place, that the disappearance of certain literature is a realistic scenario, then we have to expand this question. Will literature per se still remain in existence? Never mind the East Central European mini-sized literatures. Will Chinese literature still exist? What about the literature of India? Literature in the English language or in the Spanish language? I am convinced that yes, they will. East Central European literature will remain in existence for as long as the languages of East Central Europe remain living languages. It will last a relatively long time even due to the innate human laziness which reveals itself when it comes to learning foreign languages, thereby remaining as unsuccessful, unrequested, untranslatable, incomprehensible and perfect in its closeness as it has always been. In other words, suffering a defeat is an extremely important mission. With your marginal undisappearability, with your spasmodic clinging to each of the words of your own language, the only possible lesser language, you seem to be giving an example to all of the cultural winners, and with that, you prove that if even this poor loser refuses to give up, then literature in general will definitely not disappear, whatever anyone says about its inevitable demise. <laughs>